pleasure to introduce Peter. He's going to talk about Rogue One. So I hope we're all ready for it. All right. Everyone hear me all right? Thank you. All right. Where are all my Veracode friends? Oh, wow. There's a lot. Holy mackerel. It's a lot of you guys. All right. Friendly audience. All right. So uh, be warned. I finished this this morning. This is a brand new talk. So I don't, my cadence might be a little bit off. I welcome any feedback. You can tweet it at me or give it to me in person or, or what have you. So what I'm here to do, well, let's, a little bit about myself. I've been in AppSec for a while, so why am I here talking to you guys? Uh, I think of myself as the babblefish between security and development. I am a developer. I've been a developer for 25 years. I've been at uh, Veracode since 2006. Built a security program, an AppSec program, into our application development process. Uh, so I've been doing that for almost 11 years now. <clears throat> uh, and so I, I understand both sides of the world. So I get to go out and talk to customers and prospects about their AppSec programs, what I've seen work, what I haven't seen work. Uh, I get to tell them about how we've done it uh, at my company. Oh, yeah, and I love whiskey, by the way. So if you ever want to talk to me, buy me a whiskey. I'll sit around as long as you want. Okay, so here's what we're going to talk about. I, I want to tell you a little bit about Security Champions program. Who had, all right, so here, who here is from security? Who is a developer in the room? How about quality? All right, operations? All right, awesome. So Security Champions program. I've seen these a lot now. This is really coming up as a hot topic. Uh, this is actually the third of three different presentations by three different presenters uh, at my company. Um, done from a PM point of view, from a security point of view, and from my point of view. So we're going to talk about building one, what does it take, what do you use, you know, how do you sell it, etc. So why do we even need one? Uh, how many people have an AppSec program at their company? Okay. How many people have an AppSec program that has more than one person? All right. Less hands. How about more than five? Okay. So it starts to shrink. Um, let's think about what typical inf InfoSec or CISO type roles are responsible for. And this is really part of the problem because not every place that we go to has an AppSec team or an AppSec program, right? So the, the security team is responsible for physical security, their endpoint security, uh, they're responsible for uh, DR, um, intrusion detection and prevention, all this stuff, right? This all looks familiar to you guys. And if you do have an AppSec program, so if you're an InfoSec guy, AppSec is like this tiny little part of your job. You have so many other responsibilities, so many other things for you to worry about that if you do have an AppSec guy and you do have an AppSec program, again, you're being pulled in multiple places because, uh, let's see, from a development point of view, Waterfall, who's doing Waterfall at their current place? Don't be shy. It's okay. I know there's at least a couple in here. All right. They, they don't want to show themselves. How about Agile? How about DevOps? Okay. All right. Some of the same hands. So if you think about a, a large company, right? I've got dozens. I might have hundreds of teams that I'm responsible for. Thousands of applications. Some of the AppSec programs that I've seen have five or 10,000 applications that need to be secured. I mean, how the hell do you do that with any size team? Um, you need to do risk assessment. You're doing manual. Who does manual pen testing in their company? Okay. Who does only manual pen testing in their company? Again, people don't want, shy, don't want to show. Um, you need to do external attestations if you're a, a vendor. Uh, and you're reporting cross, across the organization. So you have all this stuff to support as part of your AppSec program. So why don't we just hire more people? <laughs> I like the giggle, thank you. Uh, yeah, for every four people that are employed, there's three job openings. There's not enough of us out there to go do a credible job at securing this, this uh, landscape. And as we've heard, every company is a software company, every single one. And we've been saying that where I work for over 10 years, right? FedEx is a software company that delivers packages. Amazon is a software company that sells everything on the planet. Right? Secure, software runs every single business. You cannot get as fast or as scaled as you want without software. 
well, why don't we just red team and pen test the applications of death? Now, there's a, uh, anyone know Shannon Lights? She works for Intuit. She runs their red team program. Remarkable. She's very, very, very talented, very smart. Uh, she talks about uh, her red team and you know how many people she has on board. I think she's got like a team of like 15 people, like super skilled. I mean, who has the money for that, right? So if we think about red team, who has a red team program at their company? One, right? It's it's rare. It's rare to be able to have white hats inside of your organization that are trying to break in. It is so expensive to do. And we only want to really do it so for the rest of us that have to rely on third parties to come in and help us with pen testing, we only want to do it on the most critical things, right? Um, it, and, by the way, it's too late in the process. So if you think about a typical AppSec program in SDLC, right, from the time that I think about it to the time that it's in production, if they're sitting there at the gate waiting to release their software, that's the wrong time to be telling them they've got 300 things to go and fix. Right? It just leads to friction. They get aggravated at you. They don't want to talk about security. They try to avoid talking to you. So we need to find a better way of doing that. Uh, it's also too slow. So even if you have internal pen testers, we're talking days or, or weeks to get a pen test done. And a lot of that time is idle time. So who here uh, has studied lean manufacturing, Toyota Way kind of stuff? Couple. All right. So. It's, it's on the reading list of things that you might want to go and look at. It's it talks about reducing or eliminating waste in the cycle of how you build things. And it could be physical things, it could be software. Again, it's, it's how long does it sit waiting for the pen tester to come and then they do their work, right? So that, that part is wasteful. If we use an external one, it could be months for you to line them up, for them to have a coverage call, to figure out you know, what's the scope of the pen test, how do we do it? And, and if you also, if you think about it, uh, of all the things that they could test, they can only test this little tiny amount out of everything, a couple of percent maybe, unless you're, you know, you've got a huge team and lots of time. Uh, it's also not cost effective for simple vulnerabilities. So in the, in the last talk, he was talking about some free stuff that will go out and find things. Uh, doing static analysis will find a lot of those vulnerabilities really early when they're really cheap to fix. Uh, before the code is actually running. You can use dynamic analysis in the same way. You're finding things before you release. Again, it's more cost effective than what you want to use a human for. So we do have room for pen testers in this world, right? We absolutely need them. Someone to sit in front of a screen and infer what the system is doing behind the scenes, right? That computers can't do. So you need to sit there, walk through these workflows, say, ah, I see what just happened there. Let me see if this is actually doing what I think it is and do some more probing testing. Again, you can't find and hire them. You can't afford them. Uh, they're super expensive. All right, so who has a security gate before they release software in their company? Okay. Yeah, I saw some of this, right? So that's the, well, kinda. So which outcome do you see when these guys come to you? Is it this one? Right? I mean, how many times have you seen that? Or, or it's the, uh, um, you put the gate down, and then they cry to their manager who cries to the VP, who eventually goes to the CIO, and then you get the phone call over to the security team saying, why are you guys standing in the way? I need my software released. Please get it out there. You have to do this. Or is it this one? It's a hard gate, and they try to go through it. They try to go under it. Usually it ends up like this. If you have a, a sturdy gate that you can enforce, this is the behavior you're going to see, right? We hope. All right, so now let's talk about development methodology. So people said no one's doing waterfall. I don't believe it, but okay. Uh, or they're doing agile fall or something like that. So let's talk about calendar time, right? So if we're talking about waterfall type methodologies, Right, we're maybe doing one to four releases a year. That's about the best you can do. And these are huge teams, by the way. They release big chunks of software with lots of risk in it, right? Um, but these you know, 100-person teams go really slow, usually miss deadlines. Uh, Agile, so we're going to start speeding up now, right? So we go from a team of like 100 to maybe a team of 6 to 12. And we're talking about maybe we do it monthly, maybe we do it a couple times a month. Or if we go to DevOps, now we're, we're cooking, right? Now we're talking about hundreds of releases a year, sometimes tens of releases a day. 
So how does the security guy keep up with all that stuff? Right, so if you think back to, I only got a couple of them, and I've got hundreds of teams and thousands of applications, and they're all releasing multiple times a day, what's the security guy to do? How do you, how do you fix that problem? So here is the, the kind of DevOps life cycle. So for, if you haven't seen this before, uh, in a DevOps team, the, the theory is that the team owns it from cradle to grave. So from the time you think about doing a project until the time you retire it and turn it off in production, the team owns the whole thing, right? So where's security in this? Usually, again, when you start off with waterfall or agile, usually it's there, right? Testing, that's when we do our testing. We, we test at the end. But really, this is what we need to think about. And it's the same thing we've learned with Agile, right? So in Agile methodologies, we combine QA and development to say, hey, let's think about quality the whole way. Let's make sure that when, it, when, it, when we say we're done, it means it works. OK, who is familiar with this? Couple. All right, so this is classic chart uh, talks about Agile methodology. So in a nutshell, we start over here on the left with our backlog. Right? This is, uh, backlog is put together by someone called a product owner. So this is a role on a scrum team in Agile. This list, uh, list of things is ordered, usually by importance, usually by amount of money we can make off the feature. Um, in, again, if we look at the waterfall projects, we're looking out trying to figure out what people will buy in a year and we're usually wrong. What we're doing here is we're saying, hey, I know the next couple of weeks or the next quarter what things I need to prepare and get out to the field. So that list is smaller, more concise, and easily uh, seen and viewed and understood. So we take that list and we go to our team. And we have what's called a grooming session where we talk about these, what are called stories. So everyone in this is a story. So as something, I want to do something with this product and it will do great things for me. Right? So this is kind of the way those things are written. We take those stories, we go into the team. So if this is my Agile team over here and we're sitting and talking about the story, uh, once everyone's agreed that they understand it, now we test for understanding. So we do something called planning poker. In planning poker, you actually have a deck of cards. They have some virtual ones you use on your phone. But the team sits in the room and they say, all right, based on some standards, so let's say that you know, this is a, a one. Again, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a number that's meant to be uh, relative to something else. So if this is how big a one is, right? so this would be a two, we say, all right, on the count of three, you tell me how big this story is. And it goes one, two, I can't remember now, five, seven, it's Fibonacci-ish. Um, 13, 20, infinity. Uh, and so we'll pull out cards on three and everyone will show them to everybody else. And I'll get a one here, I'll get a 13 up there, I'll get a five over here. I'm like, well, clearly we do not understand what we're doing yet. Because the whole goal is we need to really understand it because we're really going to commit to doing it. So now we'll go through some negotiation. We'll ask the guy that said a one, it's like, why do you think it's so easy? The guy that said it's a 13, why do you think it's so hard? The guy in the middle, what, what are you seeing? Until we come to some kind of reasonable consensus where maybe we say it's a five or a seven, it's like, ha, I understand your point, I forgot about that. It's usually things that aren't written down inside of that story, what we call acceptance criteria or story descriptions. So now once we've done that, we're gonna say, all right, so for this size team, we usually do about this many stories. So we're going to pull those off the backlog and we're going to say this is what we're committing to as a team. Now this is what's different than what you do inside a waterfall. In waterfall, everyone gets their own set of work. And we move along and we hope we get to the, at the end and we get something out of it. In Agile, what we do is we say, all right, we're going to commit to this as a team. And once we do that, we're going to stand up every single day. It's called a stand up. The whole team gets together and we say, well, what did I do yesterday? What am I doing today? What's blocking me? It is run by someone called a scrum master. Again, another role inside of a scrum team. Now, this scrum master will say, all right, well, you said you're blocked, and you said you finished early, so why don't we have you come and help? The whole point is, as a team, we're going to succeed or fail, right? Uh, we're going to track it visually, electronically, usually. Um, and at the end, we're going to reflect on it. What did we do well? What didn't we do well? Now, usually, security's here, right? <laughs> looking from afar, hoping that things are going well, and they get to those gates and you know, bad stuff happens. And what ends up happening is we fight for budget. So when they come to us with something that they want to release, say, hey, ready to ship this water now, it's like, well, you know, I found these 
10 things. And the team's like, well, I, I want to release tomorrow. Uh, can we just fix the most important ones? Who's had that conversation? Everybody. Well, what if we just fix the top two? Is that good enough? So you're fighting for budget with those teams, and that's not really the role that you want to play. That's not really where you want to be. So let's look uh, quickly at how DevOps evolved. So here's the typical waterfall where we've got these silos of people, right? So I've got my people that tell me what I'm supposed to do, the people that do it, people that test it, and then the people that run it. And we have these handoffs. So what happens is, from the left, when we sit, write down what we want to do, as soon as it clears that wall to the next team, we start to lose the focus on what the hell that was supposed to do. So by the time it gets into operations, they don't know why we built it. They don't know what it's really supposed to do. They just know how it works. Uh, it's the same thing with the application. It works as it's written, but not necessarily the way it was intended. So they don't have that knowledge. They don't understand that. And in the opposite sense, from our operations team, they understand how it works. They're the ones fighting the fires every day, but that information never really makes it all the way to the team. So in Agile, what we did was we said, let's start breaking down some walls. Let's put quality together with the people that write what we're supposed to do and the people that actually do it. So now my developers are starting to think more about quality is where you know, test-driven development started to come into play. Let's think about testing from the time that we start the work. So what you see now is there's much better continuity from uh, a business idea approach and from how the application works on that team, but we still have this reverse problem in operations. In DevOps, and we'll drop security in here somewhere, but this is a, the typical model, right? If everyone's on the same team, the operations guys are there when the PMs or the product owner says, hey, here's what we want to build, here's the audience it's meant for, here's how it's supposed to work. They can report back to the team and say, hey, it's not working the way we intended. You guys need to do some changes around this thing. And we really have a very good understanding across the board, and we end up writing better software. All right, so we realize we need some more people. Again, moving it earlier is always better. We call this shifting left. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there talking about shifting left, which means going to the place where the code starts to get written. That's the time, or even before that, is when we need to get involved. So as we sell this program, the, the intent of this is we're going to have one or two people on every single team, right? At least one. We'd like some redundancy, so maybe two people if you can afford to do that. Uh, when we talk to management, we need to say, hey, look, we're going to fit into your existing process. We're not going to slow you down. We want to make sure that you think about security from day one such that we don't end up with this nightmare at the end, these you know, trucks crashing into gates or driving around the, driving around the gate. Um, so we, we need to think about this as, there's an investment up front, right? This is not free lunch. But eventually, what you want is this preventative measure. So if you think about security, right, the best defect is one that was never written. I want to train my developers in such a way that it comes out of their fingers secure, so I'm not doing the application security at the end and then having to track these defects and fight for budget. On the team, there's less waiting. So we want everything on the team. In Agile and DevOps, what you want is everyone that's responsible and needed to do a project to be there, right? To be part of this team so we don't have these handoffs like we talked about with pen testing. And from an individual perspective, if you are one of the security champions, you're going to get additional training. You become more valuable, not only to the company that you're at, but the next company you go to. Right? We, I was talking to some of my uh, workmates before about that transition from security champion into uh, more of a security role. It's kind of the bridge between development and security. So this is a good place to start and a, a place where it might scratch an itch you didn't even know you had. So we got to describe the job to them. So the job is really about grooming. So remember we talked in that uh, Agile slide about this backlog in the grooming session. So now not only are we going to talk about stories from the perspective of how is it supposed to work, but what are the threats? How can this be attacked? What kind of security testing do I need to do on this? And in some cases, static analysis is perfectly fine. We'll take that cheap route. Maybe we want to do dynamic analysis. Maybe we need pen testing on this. Maybe this is some kind of critical control. This is the place where we want to analyze and understand that. Because in Agile, what you want is, and DevOps as well, when you say done, really done. Like, I put it down, I don't have to pick it up again. Pencil's down, test is over kind of thing. 
right? So how do we get them to understand all of the things that they need to do to make sure that it's really done? Bill of materials, so open source risk. They need to understand the components that they're bringing into their applications because when we have something like uh, strut shock or shell shock or heart bleed or you know, the deserialization problem in Apache Commons, you need someone to go to. If I have thousands of applications and they announce Apache Commons is now screwed, where, where is it in your enterprise? Which teams do I need to go talk to? How are we going to fix it? On what time frame? Do I need to put mitigations in place until then? That's the thing where your security champions become part of your incident response and say, guys, help me out here. Here's the problem. Here's what it looks like. Here's how it can be affected. Go get me a report back on where you are, what you're doing about it, and how soon you can have it fixed. Right, so this is right response team here. Uh, secure code reviews. So we're going to teach them some basics, right? They're not the be all end all. They are not security experts, but we're going to build some knowledge into them so they can do a lot of the basic stuff that we need to have done on a regular basis. And they're the conscience of security. So they're the ones that sit in the room and think about it. You can't be at every meeting. You can't be in every discussion. But these guys, again, we're talking a team of six to 12 people. They usually sit near each other. They're usually talking all the time. When things go by, they're like, oh, security over here. We need to think about this. Right? You need someone to be that eyes and ears for you. So recruiting. So we need to re recruit these people. Again, we're going to use one to two members. Um, volunteers are best, but voluntold is OK. I don't, love, I don't love that model, but we want to get them to the point where they're like, wow, I really want to do this, because you want people that, uh, that are excited by this challenge. Um, a problem that we had initially when we, when we did this was we took the people that volunteered, but that's not necessarily the people you want. We need people that are influential on that team. So usually it's your young go-getter that maybe joined the company a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago or maybe a couple years ago but is not really a senior member or an influencer on that team, you need to think about whether or not, when they say security, everyone looks and says, what do you mean security? Instead of, hey, security, and they look elsewhere. Right? So you need the right kind of people. So think about that model. And again, it doesn't have to be a developer. It could be a QA person. Um, so let's talk about what you don't want on your team. So, like I said before, a new employee. I don't want someone just coming into the company, doesn't really understand the product, doesn't understand this. They're getting up to speed on so many other things, and now we're going to fill them with more training. It's going to, the message is going to be diluted. Uh, so we don't want someone that's, that's doing that. We don't want an existing scrum role. So the product owner has a job already. The scrum master has a job already. And they might actually be coding on the team as well. We can't burden them with this other thing. And in fact, we'd like that division of labor. I mean, security loves that stuff, right? Let's talk about splitting this labor up. I want my product owner, the person that's writing the stories, to be the one that's trying to put security into it as well. Let's look at it from a different angle. Training. Got to train them. At, uh, at Vericode, there's a two-day or two-and-a-half-day intensive in-person training where we talk to them about a whole bunch of important stuff. Right, so we talk to them about security fundamentals, things that they don't think about, they were never trained on. Uh, for the software developers in the room, who took a security course, security coding course in college? Two, three, okay. Yeah, most of us are not trained in this. I did this, I graduated 25 years ago. They didn't have any application security or secure coding type constructs. Uh, it's starting to come about now, but it's still, this is a workforce that you have to invest in. Right? They don't have this stuff already. So we talked to them about CIA. We talked about you know, zero trust. We trust nothing. Uh, you have to verify it, deny by default, defense in depth. Um, we do capture the flag exercises, too. So every once a week on, I think, Tuesdays at lunch, our security expert will go into the cafeteria with his laptop. They'll have something ready for the team. And they'll say, hey, let's talk about this from the hacker point of view. Get them to understand the other side. Um, to make sure that they understand what they're trying to protect against and how easy it is sometimes to break into these things. So uh, a little bit about grooming guidelines. Again, when we talk about grooming in the typical sense in Agile, we're talking about understanding what functionality is to be provided. And this is non-functional requirements. We want to talk about 
how we're going to protect this thing from malicious use. So is this, and this is a checklist that you can provide, and this is just a sample. Um, is this a new feature that you're introducing? Uh, does it have new API endpoints that we want to think about testing? Uh, are there new UI elements that we need to think about how they might be maliciously used? New architectures, especially. Uh, who's doing like monolithic application development? Like big honking Java things, yeah. Who's doing microservices? All right, so you need to understand, how about containerization? There's a big one. All right, so you need to think about those deployment models, those architectural models from the security standpoint to say, Am I just shipping software faster with more security vulnerabilities in it? How do I think about that architecture and how it needs to be secured? How do I think about containerization and what containers I start with and what goes into them before they get into production? Uh, am I introducing new security controls into the application? Um, you know, is it new permissions, new roles, new rights, new encoders that I want to take a close look at because the last thing you want is to just kind of do those things like, oh yeah, we understand the security stuff. Those are points where we want to bring in a security expert to validate that we did it the right way. Uh, new forms or actions. Uh, is it a fix for a pen test finding? Right? Again, it's a place where you want to have an expert come in and say, yeah, you did it right. Is it happening in authentication or authorization? Is it affecting my crypto or my data validation? You know, all of these things that we worry about as security professionals, we need to enforce and, and help those security uh, champions understand that all this stuff is important. You know, what do you think about cash management? How does that get flushed? What, you know, what's the refresh rate on that? Who gets access to that? All these things, we have to give them a checklist. If it looks like any of this stuff, it's a duck. I need to talk to you about it. All right, so before I said we're going to train them to do security code reviews. Now, this isn't, like I said, this isn't deep, deep, deep analysis. We're going to give them some of the fundamentals. And by the way, we're going to guide them through this process. We'll start small. We'll validate that they're doing the right things and add more as they go. We have some people that have been doing this for years that are excellent at it and some people that are newer to it that are struggling. So you need to understand that balance of who you should be spending time with. So we'll teach them how to do basic data valid, look at da data allocation or coding or parameterization, logging and error handling. Um, we want to do a lot of mentoring with them. So some classroom training, we're going to give them like a code review test. Here's something I want you to go look at. Tell me what you find. Uh, then we're going to do some one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. Talk to them about the process of a secure code review. It's different than a peer code review that you're just looking at the code for, you know, uh, for simple errors. Um, we want to make sure that they understand how to go about this and give them strategies for doing this because they've never had to think of it from this angle. Usually, we'll have them shoulder surf us. So we'll do the code review. They'll see what the methods that we use. Then we'll, ask, we'll do the same thing. So that's why Yoda's on the back, right? He's, now he's shoulder surfing, understanding what uh, Luke is doing in his co secure code review uh, to make sure that he understands the right way to do things. So we're going to give him a little bit of power. We want to make sure that they're not going rogue on us and you know going to the dark side. They're not all powerful. We need to make sure that they understand you're there to do the basic stuff, and the more I trust you, the more authority I'm going to give to you, but understand that there are places where you're going to have to say, uh, above my pay grade, outside of my knowledge base, please come help me. That is not a bad thing. We want to make sure we give them that opportunity to do that. So a good goal for year one is to take over that security grooming. We provide them that checklist. It's going to be different based on every team. There's some basic stuff in there that's going to look the same. Um, we're going to want to do slow, deliberate ment mentoring with them. We're going to kind of transfer it to them gradually. And if you're really starting out a program for the first time, this is where it's going to be painful for you, uh, is, is giving them that one-on-one that -on -one time. We need them to know that there's, uh, again, in the Toyota way, they call the and in cord, right? Something broke. I don't understand it. I'm going to stop, stop what's going on and, and have someone come in. They need to know that they need to call us when it gets past what they're used to, past their comfort zone, because the costs of not doing that are huge for the company. And we're giving them lots of training. Um, that classroom time is the beginning of it. We have e-learning that we put them through, and we want to make sure that they're doing it. Uh, so we're going to monitor that over time. And we're going to measure them. We're going to measure individuals and teams. So from the 
security champions portion, we're going to look at their code uh, review skills. We're going to try to certify them. So we've created some certification programs to say, hey, you're good at these particular areas. Here's the parts where uh, you want to improve. If you don't measure it, you're not going to improve it. So let's make sure that we're looking at how good they are at what they're doing. So you need to do spot checks with that. Uh, especially on the people that have been doing it a while, they might get a little lazy about it. Uh, so goals for the team. <clears throat> so we looked at OpenSAM and vSIM as possible models for doing maturity models for our uh, application teams. It didn't really suit our needs. It didn't drive the behaviors that we wanted, so we kind of created our own custom one. And I've created lots of different security uh, maturity models for different companies to drive certain behaviors. So we create our own, and we've asked the teams to go off and grade yourself. Tell me where you are in your maturity curve, and let's talk about goals for getting better. So we'd love everyone to be up at a maturity level five, but we know we don't start there, and that's okay. Um, one of the things that, you know, I, I'm a soccer coach for a very long time. I always tell my kids the first day when they just meet me, is like, look, you don't have to be bad to get better. When I'm giving you instruction, when I'm correcting things, it's not because I think you're terrible, it's because I think you have, you have skills and possibilities and I want to help you get to those. So we're going to baseline, we're going to update that, and we're going to update that like every quarter is, is probably a good cadence for that, to understand are your teams getting better or not, and this is kind of where you become responsible for this. So if you think about application security, there's the preventative stuff that we do, which happens before check-in, right? So am I using the right tools? Am I following the right process? Do I have the right uh, uh, controls in place? Do I understand uh, the, uh, the things that I'm supposed to have before I'm done? So again, we want to try to secure it before that, so that's my preventative. And then everything that happens after that, so if I do static analysis and dynamic analysis and pen testing, those are all assurance. Those help me sleep at night to know that my teams are doing the right thing, right? Make sure you understand what you're expecting out of your teams and that you're getting that. Give them solid measures, clear uh, goals, and, and help them along that path. We need to reward them too. Um, training opportunities. It might be they come give a talk at a B-Sides or uh, they go attend a B-Sides or some security infosec conference or what have you. That's kind of their uh, reward for doing the security stuff is they get new training, get exposed to new ideas. Teach them to hack. So we talked about doing those capture the flag activities. This is really where engineers start to light up, right? I'm a problem solver. I love to solve problems. I love to understand things. When I see something happen that I don't get, I want to delve deeper into it. So by having these kind of activities for them to do, we're kind of stimulating their brains. Uh, swag is always good. Uh, I was at uh, a healthcare customer uh, this past week that uh, gave out water bottles with their, their logo, their application security logo on it. Again, swag is, engineers love free stuff. They love free pizza, they love free clothing, hats, water bottles, you know, whatever. Uh, so it's also back on you guys. So as we think about um, building out these security champion teams, this can't, we can't be like deaf to the things that they're challenged with, right? These teams face real challenges um, that we are not helping with today. So we got to learn about their world. So reading, uh, who's read the Phoenix Project? Excellent, good. Anyone that hasn't, it should be on your reading list. It's a really short read. It's a, you know, it's a uh, kind of funny little story. Um, it's a quick read for you. It, it will help you understand this DevOps problem, this DevOps solution. Uh, the DevOps handbook is the next one, and there's actually, for real, some security stuff in there. Uh, I don't agree with it all. I don't think it goes far enough, but you know it's in the right direction. Go to your Scrum teams. Attend some ceremonies. So there are things in Scrum called uh, you're either a chicken or a pig. Right? So the chickens don't talk. You come into the ceremony. You can just watch what's going on. I encourage you to do that. Go into those ceremonies and just stand there and watch what goes on. Watch the things that they live with every day. They're different than the things that you live with. And the more that you're compassionate about the problems that they faced, the more of an ally you're seen as. Uh, learn their tools. Maybe you should be in you know, GitHub. Who's, who does uh, security and does coding at the same time? Right, so understanding those tool chains, understanding uh, CI type servers and Jenkins and, and bug tracking systems and all those things and how those integrations play out uh, using their IDEs. Wrote, oh, that's, all right, so I found my first error on my own. Uh, write security stories. Help your team 
by actually living that life. So uh, a lot of the security guys at, at our company actually are certified product owners. What makes a good story for an Agile team? And by the way, I keep mixing, going back and forth between Agile and DevOps. Usually DevOps is run on an Agile methodology. Just we think differently about wh what the cadence of release is between those two, but the methodology is usually an Agile one. So write some security uh, stories, code. Try to do this stuff. See how hard it is, because it's not easy. Your job isn't easy for the developer, and if you try to do theirs, you'll find the same thing. All right, so you're going to have to customize this. This isn't like a one-size-fits-all program where you can say, hey, this is the way we're going to do it. This is what I saw on the slide deck. You have to think about your own culture. A lot of times when I go in and talk about uh, AppSec programs, you know, one of the biggest gaps is usually mandate. Right, so the reason they get to drive around the gate that we saw before is because there isn't a strong mandate from the development side of the house. You don't have backing from the VPs, the CIO. Um, it's one of the critical things to getting a successful AppSec program is to have the developers actually be measured on this. So getting these things in their goals and have it affect their salary is a key to getting them to do the right, make the right behavior modifications. Again, empathy. Their job is hard too. Um, they face different challenges. Uh, you should be in those teams looking at them, trying to live that life, trying to understand it a little bit better. Over-communicate. Uh, so this reporting that we talked about of, of you know, where we are from a maturity model standpoint, how good your teams are, how good your security champions are, um, you want to make sure that you're, you're constantly communicating about security in a way that is friendly to those development teams. And this is a, a critical one. Be extremely responsive. It's going to take a lot of your time to build this program. And they don't want to feel like you left them on the island. It's like, OK, you're in charge of security. See you later. i got other stuff to do. Eventually, you get to move from the tactical to the strategic. But you need to start with the tactical. You need to train these people up. You need to have some level of trust in them such that you can let them go and say, all right, you are now responsible for this much. Anything over this, please call me. And when they call, you've got to pick up the phone. You have to be there for them. Stay engaged with this program, right? Those capture the flag exercises. It may seem like drudge work to you. Yes, I've already done this one, or I, I built this one years ago, but it's new to these guys. Be incredibly engaged with them. Uh, go out to lunch with them. Take them on little team trips sometimes. That, that team building, so in, um, in some comp companies, they call them guilds. So usually an Agile team wants to have all the people that need to do everything. So I've got development and security and quality and operations and stuff. But those teams then cross-pollinate other teams. So the, the guy that loves security will get together with the other ones, like birds of a feather type engagements, and will build these guilds. Build that teamwork such that working with each other, maybe mentoring each other. All right. Anybody have any questions? How do you do for time? Ooh, shorter than I thought. Yes. Um, I have a question about moratoriums. Are you familiar with them? Uh, moratoriums. Moratoriums. Okay. So typically larger corporations, end of month, end of quarter, sales don't want any kind of leads going out. They just want the stake of money, so they can close their deals and you know hit their numbers. Mm -hmm. Right, so most of the time it's above your pay grade, as, as was pointed out, right? All of this stuff is, is risk versus reward, right? So the, these end of the quarter things or end of the year type things, yeah, I've seen a lot of those. You need to make that strong case. If you have better information, so if we know that Apache Commons is, or, or let's take uh, the Struts vulnerability, which was under active attack the second it was launched. If we start showing them the landscape and the, and the surface area that's being attacked and help them understand exactly what could happen, put a little bit of the fear of God into them, they're going to think differently about saying, no, 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 we've got to have stability here. It's like, no, we're going to get breached if we don't fix this stuff. You need to build that case and understand that you're not always going to win. Right? So you need to come there with your security champions behind you that are, more pa that are passionate about it like you are. So if you, you build that army of people, 
they're going to be in that room saying, no, really, I, I need to fix this, and we need to fix it now. Um, so it's about building up and having enough data. It's like, well, I think we're vulnerable. No, I know we're vulnerable. And across our landscape, 50% of our applications are in risk of breach right now. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I had an issue with that because when we were doing uh, Agile and we were moving user stories across, we defined the user story and then part of the grooming of that user story to get it from the coding stage to the QA stage. The QA stage had entrance criteria. Mm -hmm. Had the developer done static analysis? Had he done unit testing? Mm -hmm. And then the e exit criteria from the QA stage. Right. So so what I was pointing out is this is what I see in most organizations. There are organizations that do it well, that understand how to bake that into stories, and that might not be a place where we need a security champions program. It's the people that, it's like one InfoSec guy that has a little tiny bit of stuff that they're supposed to do around AppSec with everything else they're supposed to do that needs to go out and build this, this, uh, this army to go help them get this job done because they can't attend, in the case of hundreds of teams, all of the grooming ceremonies and make sure that security's there. It is, and that's where we want it. We want it baked in there. What, what I'm showing you is the reality of what I see at most companies. Anybody else? All right. <laughs>